Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks for that uh, very great introduction and good morning or good, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are, um, you are joining us. Um, the topic of today is, um, in my opinion, one of the most critical in the food security and nutrition um, sector, especially in developing countries where the problem is still very huge. In fact, the, the development community is now very clear about the fact that we have a lot of innovations, very interesting research findings, new products and um, services that could solve most of the challenges we are, we are facing today, including food insecurity and malnutrition. But the biggest um, challenge that remains is how we move from isolated experiments niche or local level innovations to large scale change and broader systemic impacts. The challenge, for example, is still how we make sure that more farmers make use of a climate resistant seed or how more women adopt solutions that improve maternal and child health and nutrition. We cannot basically continue to have research findings or innovations that are known only by the researchers or that have been used only by some farmers in a, in a remote village of Ethiopia or, or India. We must definitely bring innovations to, to scale. The problems and challenges related to food and nutrition security are in a way quite similar across regions and, and contexts. So one innovation that is piloted uh, somewhere might also be very useful in other uh, places. And that's exactly where scaling those innovations come into play so that we don't repeat the same experiment. We don't keep trying new things, developing new innovation that are just replications of, um, of other innovations in the, uh, in the world. And to do so, we must keep in mind two key things. The first one is to ensure that there is deliberate replications of innovations so that they reach many more uh, people, especially the poor and, and the marginalized, including smallholder farmers. And the second, we must also make sure that we change policies so that new development strategies are designed and institutional resources are redirected towards the scaling of those innovations. And for this to happen, it's very important to mobilize the power of the public sector but also to work definitely with the private sector by demonstrating business cases for the innovations, establishing public-private partnerships that brings those innovation at the scale, especially for the poor. So, One more minute. In, yes, in, my, in, 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 in conclusion, I, I think we are, we are less than a decade to the deadline of the SDGs, especially the SDG number two related to food security and nutrition. The goals are so ambitious that it needs transformation at scale. And the good news is that we have many innovations and solutions that are just waiting for the best routes and mechanisms to reach those who need them the most. There were still 800 million people who are affected by food insecurity and nutrition issues. And the next milestone in curbing that number is to bring the existing innovations and those that are coming to scale. Hi, Charlie. So thank you very much, uh, Daniel. That's what I wanted to share for my, uh, my initial speech. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Fréjou, and um, some uh, strong arguments there in favor of uh, the proposition, how to move from isolated innovations to systemic impact. Uh, you say uh, it's needed to have a transformation at scale and it requires both public and private sector uh, to engage together. Well, I'm very curious to find out out uh, how case as uh, an opponent of this statement uh, will respond to that. So case, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much uh, for joining. My main argument will be that this proposition is historically incorrect and utter nonsense in the current system. No, be, be quiet, be, uh, no, I'm starting. Scaling innovations is essential for improving food and nutrition security of marginalized groups. The proposition talks about marginalized groups and the majority of these are small farmers with little resources, as well as farm laborers with females of both groups, even in a more vulnerable position. These are precisely the people that are not likely to benefit from scaling innovations. In fact, scaling of innovations in food systems tends to put farmers and laborers out of business. 
Here in the Netherlands, we had 300,000 small farms after World War II, and now we have only 30,000 farms left, with hundreds of thousands of people pushed out of agriculture. In the Netherlands, these people were absorbed by the industry and service economy, but in many southern countries, these opportunities do not exist, so that innovation will lead to further marginalization. Of course, some will benefit. Normally, these are those who adopt first, usually not the marginalized, and who can then temporarily produce cheaper than others. Then market dynamics will force others to follow suit, be it that this second wave is already benefiting less as prices will tend to drop with increased production. And subsequently, those who cannot follow will eventually become unviable and be further marginalized. This is the technological treadmill already described by Willard Cochrane in 1958 and still valid today. Not only marginal farmers will be affected negatively, there's a lot of evidence that new technologies such as mechanization and weedy sites are putting many poor farm laborers out of business as well. So my first point is that history has learned that scaling of innovations is going to be lead to an exodus of vulnerable people out of agriculture or a further marginalization of those who cannot leave. The second point links to the possible counter argument that this all depends on the innovations that are being scaled. There is some theoretical validity in this, but the practical point is that the available innovations today are completely biased towards the dominant neoliberal system that we're in, which tends to reinforce the dynamics that I just described. Most innovations are geared towards enhanced labor productivity, scale enlargement and integration into commercial value chains that are dominated by the food industry. They fit a typically Northern market logic from which marginalized people have little to expect. To expect. Third, we lack the methodological tools to filter out innovations that may be beneficial for marginalized groups. We see all the time that innovations are promoted without proper checks on long-term effects and trade-offs and more as a means to satisfy donors than to realize social equity objectives. Responsible scaling is at its infancy. We simply do not have the methods and tools to prevent unwanted side effects. You have been muted, Case. I'm sorry, the last uh, 10 seconds. I'm sorry, Case. I hope you can hear us. Oh, and there was a concluding remark there that we unfortunately missed. Case, um, the last uh, 15 seconds of your speech was uh, muted, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry about that. But I, if you wish, you, please, uh, if you can... Uh, my last uh, sentence was, we first need to create a level playing field before innovations are going to improve anything for marginalized groups. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm unfortunate of the muting issue, but I'm sure that the gist of your very pro provocative uh, position was uh, made very clear. I meant statements such as responsible scaling is still in its infancy. There will be an exodus of vulnerable people if scaling continues and scaling is biased. Three very large statements, I would say that I'm sure will tease the audience um, of replying and providing their own thoughts and experiences here. So thank you both um, debaters. Um, 